together at this time to Book of Galatians, chapter 4, and verse 21. Hmm. Galatians 4, 21, for our message from God's Word this morning. Galatians 4, 21 will be located on page 12, 46, if you're using the church Bible this morning. This morning being October 24th, 2021. Our text this morning will be in Galatians 4, 21, right on down to the end of the chapter in verse 31. And the title of this morning's message is Listening to the Law. Listening to the Law. And we begin with the story of a man and his wife who were trying to get some sleep one night, but the neighbor's dog just wouldn't stop barking. Finally, the wife, a woman of no particular hair color, <laughs> said, I've had enough of this. She went downstairs and returned a little while later. And her husband asked her, he said, the dog is still barking. What have you been doing? And she said, I put that dog in our backyard. Let's see how the neighbors like all of that barking. <laughs> Get a cat. <laughs> I guess she thought she fixed the problem. <laughs> well, while that couple were obviously listening to the dog, the Galatians had not been listening to the law. <clears throat> the law that they were desiring to put themselves under. At least, that's what it says in Galatians 4.21, <clears throat> where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. <clears throat> Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? That's Paul's way of telling them, if you're desired to be under the law, <laughs> you must not be listening to what the law says. Earlier, in your first cross reference, he told them in Galatians 3.10, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, <clears throat> Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And when Paul says there, it is written, He's talking about the place where it was written in the law. Well, obviously the Galatians hadn't heard about that curse part. And now, here in chapter 4, Paul's going to tell them about something else in the law that they evidently hadn't heard. In the next verse of our text, in verse 22, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. And you know the story here. We talked about it during our scripture reading this morning. Abraham's wife, Sarah, couldn't have children, as it says in your next reference there, in Genesis 11.30, where it says that 
Sarai was barren. She had no child. So when God told Abraham a chapter later in Genesis 12, 3, <clears throat> In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, <laughs> that told Abraham that God planned to give him a seed by miraculously opening Sarah's womb to give him a son. But when a whole bunch of years went by and Sarah still had no children, she decided to help God keep his promise. <laughs> she told Abraham to sleep with her handmaid, Hagar, was a bondmaid, a slave. He did, and she bore him a son named, do you remember from our scripture? It was Ishmael. Then, God miraculously opened Sarah's womb, and she bore him a son named Isaac. But, there was a big difference between those two boys difference that Paul points out in verse 23 back in your Bible where he says but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh but he of the free woman was born by promise the big difference between those two boys was in how they were born. Isaac is said to have been born of promise because God had promised him that he would come. But Ishmael is said to have been born, quote, after the flesh. Now, let me be clear about something here. Abraham's physical flesh, his physical body, was involved in the conception of both of those two boys. So the flesh there has to refer to what you read about in your next verse, your next cross-reference in John 1.13, the will of the flesh. It was God's will for Abraham to wait for God to miraculously empower his physical body to be able to father Isaac. Amen. But it was Abraham's will, the will of his flesh, to try to help God keep his promise by sinfully producing and fathering Ishmael. And as Paul is about to go on in your Bible to say, those two sons were symbolic of something. Verse 24 says, Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar, or that's the New Testament spelling of Hagar. Now that word allegory, that's a word that only appears right there in your Bible. That means we can't do what we usually do to define words and compare scripture with scripture. But my old trusty dictionary says that a synonym for an allegory is an illustration. And a Bible illustration is a story that Bible teachers use to help people understand things in the Bible. Illustrations are particularly helpful when you're teaching little children. And that fits the context here, folks, because up in verse 19, 
couple of verses earlier, Paul just got done calling the Galatians what? My little children. <laughs> when you teach little children, you teach a Bible truth, then you tell a story that illustrates that truth. And Paul has just spent a couple of chapters here in Galatians teaching them the Bible truth about the law. So now he's saying, little children, let me tell you a story that illustrates the truth about the law. And now that he's told them the story of Hagar and Sarah, he starts to explain the details of the story. He begins in this very verse, verse 24, by saying that these two women and their two sons represent two covenants. One covenant from Mount Sinai. And we know which covenant he means because in your next reference, we see what happened on Mount Sinai. In Deuteronomy 33.2, the Lord came from Sinai and from his right hand went a law for them. And he meant the law of Moses. And as we've talked about many times, the law was a covenant. And that's the Bible word for a contract. And in the contract of the law, God gave the people of Israel 613 commandments. And then he told them that if they could keep them perfectly, he'd give them eternal life. <laughs> well, they couldn't, of course. That's why verse 24 says that uh, this covenant gendereth not to salvation, but to bondage. Now that word gendereth, and I looked that one up, not a word we use very much, it, it means to beget or to father, uh, like it does in the only other verse in the Bible where the word is used in Job 21 and verse 10, where it says, their bull gendereth, and faileth not. Their cow calveth, and casteth not her calf. <laughs> now, if you don't remember what that's about, that's talking about how everything always seems to go right for unsaved people. <laughs> their bulls uh, mate with their cows, and their bulls don't fail to impregnate their cows. And then it says their cows have baby calves and, and, and don't miscarry. They don't cast their calves out. So, when verse 24 here says that the law gendereth to bondage, it means that the law begets people to bondage. It fathers a bunch of bond slaves. Because, listen, telling people thou shalt and thou shalt not, well, that's how you treat bond slaves. You tell them exactly what to do and what not to do. So under the law, the Jews were slaves under what the Bible sometimes called the bondage of the law, the yoke of the bondage of the law. And Paul finishes verse 24 by saying that the covenant of the law is illustrated by Hagar the slave. And then he goes on to explain how she illustrates it in verse 25 in your Bible. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, 
and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now, that phrase, answereth to, that's only found one other time in your Bible, in Proverbs 27, and verse 19, where it says, In water, face answereth to face. You know what that means, when you look at your reflection in a pool of water, you see exactly what your face looks like. Yeah. <laughs> now they say that mirrors don't lie, and that's true, and lucky for me, they don't laugh either. <laughs> I'm going to be a back at you. Uh, but your image in a mirror or in water answers to what you look like. <clears throat> so verse 25 is saying that Hagar looks like Jerusalem. That is, you can see Jerusalem in Hagar's story. She was in bondage to Abraham and Sarah. They told her, thou shalt, and thou shalt not. And all the children that she eventually had through Ishmael were also slaves because the son of a slave was a slave. And in that story, you can see the story of the people of Jerusalem. They too were slaves because, listen, the law of Moses enslaved them from day one. You know what happened on day one? Do you know what happened when Moses gave the law? The day he gave the law, he told them, in your next reference, in Deuteronomy 27, verses 1 to 9, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. The day Moses gave Israel the law, they became God's people. Now, he didn't tell them what kind of people they were. He didn't tell them they were slaves, but they became the people of God. And all the children they had after that were also bond slaves because the child of a slave is a slave. And that's what Paul was trying to get the Galatians to see with this, this allegory, this illustration. That the covenant of the law puts you in bondage and treats you like a slave, like it did for Hagar. Now, maybe you noticed in verse 25 that Paul calls Jerusalem, Jerusalem that now is. And uh, that's because if you know your Bible, you know there's another Jerusalem coming, right? One that Paul talks about in the next verse of our text, back in your Bible, in verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. You've heard me say before that there's a Jerusalem above us in heaven. One that you read about in Hebrews 12.22. Where the writer says and talks about the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We studied the book of Daniel. We saw there's a Persia up there and there's a Grisha up there. There's a Jerusalem up there as well. And someday that Jerusalem is going to come down here to the earth. The Apostle John saw a vision of that in your next reference in Revelation 21, verse 2. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. 
That's the Jerusalem that will be as opposed to the one that now is over there in Israel. That, ch that Jerusalem also had children. But verse 26 says her children are not slaves. Verse 26 says, her children are free. So she's illustrated by Abraham's free wife, Sarah. She wasn't a slave like Hagar was. She was free. So all her kids were free. Because the uh, kids of a free woman are free. So... Who do her kids represent? They represent saved Jews under the law, folks. Saved Jews who knew they couldn't keep the law well enough to be saved and needed God to save them. But when Paul tells those Gentiles in Galatia that Jerusalem which is above is the mother of us all, he was telling them that the heavenly Jerusalem is also the mother of Gentiles who know they can't keep the, well, the law well enough to be saved. And if you think about it, if you think it through, that just makes sense. Because that Jerusalem is being illustrated by Sarah, right? And what did Paul call Sarah's husband in Romans 4, verses 10 and 16? Paul talked about the circumcision and the uncircumcision, and then he said, Abraham is the father of us all. <laughs> See how that works? Abraham is the father of saved Jews and saved Gentiles. It just makes sense that Sarah would be the mother of saved Jews and saved Gentiles. We're all Abraham's spiritual children. Now, saved Jews at that time were still under the law. Their freedom is the kind that the Lord tried to tell some unsaved Jews about in John 8. Verses 32 to 34. He told them, and you know this quote, it's even a lot of unbelievers know this part. You shall know the truth, he told those unsaved Jews. And the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, well, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. Of course, they were wrong about that. They'd been in bondage to Babylon for 70 years. <laughs> but they hadn't forgotten it. See, that it was just their religious pride coming through. But anyway, to get to the point, they said, we were never in bondage to any man, so how sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered, whosoever committeth sin, is the servant of sin. He was talking about being made free from the bondage of sin. That's the freedom that saved Jews had under the law. And it's also the freedom that we have under grace. Now, one of these two women had way more kids than the other one as Paul goes on to say in verse 27, back in your Bible, this is where we're going to spend some time. Because it's a, got a lot in it. In verse 27 he says, For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate, have many more children than she which hath a husband. Now, before we get into the, the details of the story here, I have to point out that when Paul says it is written there, he's quoting the first verse of Isaiah 55. 
full war. And I didn't give you the reference, because it's pretty much has, how it says here. But listen, what chapter comes right before <laughs> Isaiah 54? Who's buried in Grand's tomb? <laughs> what chapter comes before Isaiah 54? <laughs> Isaiah 53. And what's the famous subject of Isaiah 53? The cross. The death of Christ for our sins, right? The very last words of Isaiah 53, I did give you. In verse 12, it says, he, speaking of Christ, he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And folks, that's how Jews and Gentiles became free from the bondage of sin. Christ paid for their sins and made us children of Jerusalem, which is above. That's part of why he's quoting this. But now, when we consider the details of the story here, a couple of the details don't seem quite right. Most of them do. For instance, in verse 27 it says Sarah was barren. And we know that detail is right because we saw the verse that said she was barren. And when verse 27 also says Sarah Travail not. Well, that part was also true because barren women are women who, who, who don't travail. They've never labored in childbirth. But that means that the other woman here, she which hath a husband, must be Hagar. So how can it be said that Hagar had a husband, and really all she had was a one night stand with Sarah's husband, Abraham. Well, don't forget what we saw in our scripture reading this morning in Genesis 16 3. In Genesis 16 3, it says, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abraham to be his one night stand. Is that what you're saying? No. Mm -hmm. To be his wife. All they had was a one night stand, but there's a sense in which that made Hagar Abraham's wife. But that means there's a sense in which Abraham was her husband. <laughs> so in verse uh, 27 there, Paul is right to call Hagar, she which hath a husband. That detail turns out to be right after all. Mm -hmm. But that implies Sarah didn't have a husband, doesn't it? So why is Paul implying that Sarah did not have a husband when we know she did, Abraham? In what sense did Hagar have a husband and Sarah not have a husband? <clears throat> well, don't forget. <clears throat> this is an allegory, folks. And both women represented something. Hagar represented earthly Jerusalem. Jerusalem was under the law. And at that time, God gave the law and became their husband. Look what God said to, the, uh, to Jerusalem in Jeremiah 2.2. 2. He told Jeremiah, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember the love of thine Spousals. That's the Bible word for engagement. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness. The people of Israel got engaged to God and married him in the wilderness. They got hitched the day that God gave them the law in the wilderness. You say, well, how do you know that? 
<laughs> well, this is it. I found this part very interesting. Do you remember what happened the day God gave him the law in your next reference in Exodus 24, verses 6 and 7? It says, Moses took the book of the covenant, the covenant of the law, and read it in the audience of the people of Israel. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Now, when they promised to obey their husband God, doesn't that sound a lot like what brides used to say as part of their wedding vows? Some of you are old enough to remember when uh, a bride would vow to love, honor, and obey her husband. Raise your hand if you're old enough to remember that. <laughs> Just like the Jews promised to obey their husband, God. Now, if the Jews kept their promise to obey their husband, God, he promised in the covenant of marriage, the covenant of law, the marriage is called the covenant elsewhere in the Bible, he promised to provide for them and protect them. And did you know that wedding vows used to have husbands say that to wives? It used to be the husband would say, I'll provide for you. I promise to provide and for you and protect you. I had to look that part up, though, because even I'm not old enough to know that part. That's online. You can check it out. Now, look what else Moses said to Israel the day he gave them the law in Deuteronomy 26, 17 and 18. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy lawfully wedded God and to keep his commandments. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his lawfully wedded peculiar people as he hath promised thee. Now there's nothing wrong with your printout. I, I just added that. Lawfully wedded part, but listen, that word avouch there, that's a synonym for the word avow, as in wedding vows. God was making wedding vows. They were making wedding vows to him. God vowed to make them his peculiar people. And I know you think I'm peculiar. And some of you are like, oh. <laughs> that word means something that belongs to you exclusively, to the exclusion of all others. And you know what? That sounds like the part of the wedding vows where you say, I'll forsake all others and keep myself only unto you. At least those are the vows I've been using for the last 42 years, the ones Pastor Stan gave me 42 years ago. You know, that reminds me to say, if you've ever wondered where all our wedding vows come from, come from the book. <laughs> so Hagar is said to have a husband because she represented Israel under the law, and Israel under the law was married to God. But it's implied that Sarah didn't have a husband because she represented New Jerusalem, the mother of saved Jews. And listen, saved Jews don't have a husband. At least they don't yet. They won't have a husband until they marry God after the millennium. As the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 20, verse 7, and verses uh, at chapter 21, verses 9 and 10. He saw a vision, and when the thousand years of the millennial kingdom are expired, one of the seven angels talked with me, saying, Come, come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And what did he show him? He showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. At the beginning of God's eternal kingdom, folks, he's going to marry the saved Jews in New Jerusalem. And you know what? 
He's going to have more children, more saved children, more saved Jewish children than Jerusalem under the law ever had. And that solves my last problem with verse 27 there when it says that Sarah had more kids than Hagar. <laughs> Listen, that has never been true at any time in history. Sarah is the mother of all the Jews, right? And Hagar is the mother of all the Arabs. And there has always, and I mean always, been way more Arabs in the world than Jews. I looked in the current figures, or estimates of course, but right now they're saying there are 14 million Jews on the planet, but there are 200 million Arabs. And it's always been that way. So how can verse 27 say that Sarah has more children than Hagar? Well, the answer is that Sarah will someday have more kids than Hagar. Because someday there's going to be more saved Jews in New Jerusalem than there, than there were ever unsaved. <coughs> you see, Paul is quoting the prophet Isaiah here, right? And as a prophet, Isaiah was predicting that Sarah would have more kids than Hagar someday in God's eternal kingdom. That's the context of Isaiah 54, verse 1. This is where I, I give you the verse Paul's quoting. And then I show you the context. In Isaiah 54, 1 to 13, it starts out, More are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. For thy, why is that? For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. All, the, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Well, when will saved Jews be married to their maker and all be taught of the Lord and have peace like it says there? Not till New Jerusalem, folks. And here's the part where I, what I believe, and I'm pretty sure Brother Dave believed as well. And that is as God's eternal kingdom continues to unfold in the ages to come after the millennium, Sarah is going to continue to have children. And I don't know if David had other verses, but this is the one I always use in Isaiah 9, 7. Of the, speaking of Christ in verse 6, you know, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, that verse, Isaiah 9, 6. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. In God's eternal kingdom, Saved Jews in the New Jerusalem are going to continue to have kids as God continues with his original plan to populate the heavens and the earth with people. A plan that got slightly interrupted for 6,000 years by Adam and his sin. And since New Jerusalem is the mother of us all, you and I are going to be right there with those unsaved Jews, a part of God's eternal purpose. And here some of you thought your days of having kids were done. Not <laughs> glad mine are, at least don't get to that. Anyway. Now, the reason Paul's telling the Galatians all this was because as believers, they were in the minority. In Paul's day, there was a whole lot more unsaved Jews than there were saved Galatians. But that's all going to change someday. And I will bet you the Galatians were glad to hear Paul remind them that Isaiah predicted that that was all going to change someday. Because it's hard to be in the minority, ain't it? Uh, isn't it? Uh, you learned that when you got saved, right? 
Then it got even harder after you learned the grace message. <laughs> you became part of an even smaller minority. But if you think about it, it was a whole lot harder for Noah and his family. I mean, those eight people in were the vast majority in the midst of untold millions when they got on that ark. When they stepped off the ark, they were the overwhelming majority because the Lord knew what it left but them. <laughs> And listen, the day is coming when we'll be in the majority. We're in the minority now. We're going to be in the majority someday because I believe we're going to be part of New Jerusalem. And as we read on in Galatians 4, it says we're part of Abraham's legitimate children. In verse uh, 28 it says, Paul gets to the point, he says, now we brethren, you and me, members of the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles, saved Jews and Gentiles, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. God promised Abraham a legitimate son, not the illegitimate one he had with Hagar or Ishmael. God promised Abraham a legitimate son by a miraculous birth. Sure enough, Isaac was miraculously born to Two people who were way too old to be able to have children. And our new birth is just as miraculous. And it's just as apart from the works of the flesh. Because it's just as true of us what it says in John 1, 12 and 13 to the Jews. As many as received him, talking about Christ, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born, watch now, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but we were born God. If you're happy about that, say me, say amen. Amen. Say amen. But here's the thing. Along with the blessing of being Abraham's legitimate children, we inherit a problem that his legitimate child Isaac had. One that Paul goes on to talk about in your Bible now in verse 29. Verse 29 he says, but, after saying we're the children of promise, but as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Now, he that was born after the flesh was Hagar's son Ishmael, right? So he's the one who persecuted Sarah's son Isaac. In other words, I know you'll find this hard to believe, his unsaved son persecuted his saved son. And as Paul says in verse 29 there, that's an allegory too. Because that was still happening. As Paul told the Thessalonians in, uh, is it 1 Thessalonians? Yeah, I think it is. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15. The Jews, killed, this is the unsaved Jews, killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and had persecuted us. Now, if you're wondering about that story back there in Genesis and you're wondering why Hagar's son persecuted uh, Isaac, it's because of what God said about Hagar's son in your next verse, in verse 30. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Go home and read that story again. You'll see the details match. God told Abraham to cast Ishmael out and not let him have any part of the inheritance he was given Isaac. Isaac. 
And for some odd reason, Ishmael didn't take that well. <laughs> so he started to persecute Isaac. And maybe you're not carnal enough to understand why he did that, but I am. I told you before, when I was a kid, I wanted a stingray bicycle. You know, with the ha high handlebars and the banana seat, you know. But my mean old father informed me that I was old enough to work for the things that I wanted. <laughs> Meanie. I was old enough to work for the things I wanted at his tool and die shop. Now, he was nice enough to offer to pay half of the bicycle's costs. And he was also nice enough to bump my salary up from 15 cents an hour, where he started me at, to 50 cents an hour. Oh, now we're talking serious money here. <laughs> so I went to work that summer to log the 75 hours. Seemed like an eternity that it would take to pay for half of a $75 bike. But in the meantime, my kid brother, my little brother had a birthday. And my dad <coughs> gave him a Stingray bicycle. Oh, oh, and I can remember to this day resenting the fact that my father just gave him as a free gift the thing that I was having to work so hard for. I remember how angry it made me and how I began to persecute my little uh -huh. brother <laughs> <laughs> by mocking him. You see, my dad had my dad had not bought him a Schwinn. Oh no, he went to Sears and bought him a cheaper Stingray bicycle, and I would often mock my poor little brother <laughs> about how cheap his bike was compared to the one that I eventually got, and yes, I eventually got it. He said, well, wait a minute, well, mocking isn't persecuting, but if you know the story, folks, that is how Ishmael persecuted. I look at Genesis 21, verse 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking him. And you know what? Go home and read, read the whole book of Genesis. You will see that is the only persecution that he ever gave. And you know what? It's the only persecution in your life. The only persecution I'll, I, I've ever suffered. I remember the first time I suffered. I was in high school telling, telling my classmates in an open forum thing we had that the, the Lord was coming, the rapture was coming, and one kid out of I remember his name, I won't tell you his name, but to this day, I remember saying, Jesus is coming back. When? Today? You know, he's just mocking me. <laughs> That's the first time, and there were other times too. If you've been open about your faith, you know what I'm talking about. But listen, that that answers the question about your last reference that I'm often asked at PBS, where in 2 Timothy uh, 3.12 it says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I get emails saying, well, I think I live pretty godly, but never suffered any persecution, so was God wrong about that? And the reason they asked that, of course, is because they were never persecuted by being beheaded or jailed or anything like that, like they are in some countries and like Christians used to be all the time. But the Bible says if you live godly, you're going to get mocked, as some of you know by experience. <laughs> by the way, this is part of the reason the Galatians got tired of being in the minority and joined those legalizers under the law because they got tired of the persecution. But Paul assures the Galatians here that those unsaved Jewish legalizers who were in the majority then 
someday be cast out of God's inheritance. But Paul closes this passage in verse 31 by reminding the Galatians that they won't be among those that are cast out. In verse 31 he says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. He's not going to cast us out. Because we are children of the free. And listen, that is where they needed to take their stand against those legalizers. In that freedom. And that's something Paul's going to... We're going to see Paul say next week. Let's take the time to read chapter 5, verse 1. After saying in verse 31, we're children of the free, he says, stand fast, therefore, in that liberty, in that freedom, the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Remember, he didn't just make you free from your sins. He made you free from the law like we sing about. But in closing, you know, years ago I saw one of those time travel movies. And I'll never forget, as the, as the time traveler got ready to go back to the past, a man asked him, what do you like the best about the future? And the guy said, well, TV was nice. <laughs> and... The other man said, if you think TV was nice, you didn't see enough of it. <laughs> and you know what? All the Christians today who want to be under the law haven't heard enough of it. They haven't been listening to the law as we've been talking about here. That means it's up to you and I to make them see that God has so much more for them under grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're...